Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. If, like me, you've recently switched from one brand of smartphone to another, you may have noticed that the volume control on the provided earbuds from one manufacturer may not necessarily be compatible with the new phone that you've chosen. This was the case in, uh, for me when I switched from an iPhone with the Apple EarPods to an Android phone with its provided earbuds. Now this would normally not be a problem, however, despite the uh, Android ear, uh, earbuds being quite good, I found that, in my opinion, they were not quite acoustically as good as the Apple EarPods. Now neither of these uh, earbuds, or neither of these sets of earbuds stands up at all to my actual on-ear headphones, However, uh, in general, I have found that the earpods have quite nice acoustic response. So at this crossroads, I have effectively two options. I can buy a nicer set of earbuds that are compatible with an Android phone, or I can attempt to modify the Apple earpods to be able to use the same controller switch as the Android earbuds. Now before I start this modification, a little bit of theory as to why these are not compatible. The way that the volume control and the start-stop button in any of these headphone controllers works is it sends a predetermined code down the microphone channel of this 4-pin tip ring ring uh, mini stereo 3.5 millimeter jack. Now because the different manufacturers use different proprietary uh, audio signals from these devices to create that, uh, to create that signal pathway, the different devices across manufacturers are not necessarily compatible. So what we need to do is we need to retain the device, the control switch for the brand of device that we're going to be using while modifying the existing headphones to use the transducers from the pair that we think uh, is more acoustically pleasing. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to show you how to cut these uh, Apple EarPods off of the original Apple uh, control switch and solder them on to the lines feeding from these Android headphones from its control switch. Now before we get started, I'd like to note that this may be destructive to both headphones that you're using. If these are extremely high-end earbuds or headphones, I don't necessarily recommend doing this you may want to practice on some cheaper headphones before you start this process. So before we get started, I'm going to show you what tools I recommend for this procedure. First off, a soldering iron. You want a nice uh, fine tip, high temperature soldering iron that you can use for both melting enamel and soldering the wires together. A hot glue gun is recommended because this, uh, the hot glue will help keep the connection stable and keep the heat shrink from moving around when we're finished. A heat gun is highly recommended for shrinking this heat shrink that we're going to be using. However, you can also do this with a lighter. The lighter may cause charring if not used, uh, if not applied evenly, however, so a heat gun is preferable if available. You're also going to want a set of wire cutters as well as some wire snips, a set of scissors, and some electrical tape. And you want to choose an electrical tape that's relatively thin so it can fit within the inside of the heat shrink when wrapped. Additionally, you're going to want a flux pen and some solder for your soldering iron, a multimeter for checking the continuity and polarity of the uh, wiring within the cable, and for stripping enamel off of the wire, I recommend a sharp knife and a piece of wood or something that you're not afraid of scoring up with the knife while you're cutting. The first thing you're going to want to do now is you're going to want to take the donor headphones, that is the headphones that have the transducers that you like, and you're going to want to uh, mark out and cut the headphones just above the switch. So what you want to do here is try to get a roughly equivalent length on both the left and right earbud. That way it's, uh, they're not imbalanced on the new cable. And mark the location with your fingers, take the wire cutters or the scissors, and snip the two cables like so. Try to keep it away from the soldering iron if possible. So I'll snip this one as well. And now that those two have been cut, we have our two earbuds. Now uh, we're not immediately going to discard this cable yet because we need to determine the polarity of the individual colors of wire. That way we make sure that we get the polarity correct on the uh, recipient cable. 
if we fail to get the polarity correct, the one headphone may push when the other is pulling, and it may lead to an unsatisfactory listening experience. So what we want to do here is ignore the side with the dongle on it. This time take the opposite side, and what we're going to do is take the wire cutter, or wire strippers, and uh, strip back this wire with a relatively uh, high gauge stripper, as, as high as is available. So now that we've stripped back the insulation, now you can see what looks like three conductors. However, this very small conductor is actually just a piece of nylon cord to add structural integrity to the cable. These other two con conductors are the ones that actually carry uh, signal. However, we don't know which one is supposed to be grounded and which one is supposed to be the line or signal wire. What we need to do is figure out where they correspond on this barrel connector. Now in this case, because this is an Apple barrel connector, the ground is actually the second to last ring, the last ring being the microphone, and this is either going to be the tip or the inner ring, depending on which channel it is. So in order to make this determination, what we need to do is strip back some of the insulation and apply some solder to the conductor in order to penetrate through the enamel. Then we'll use the continuity tester feature of the multimeter to determine which one is which, and we'll make note of that for our future application. So here we go. This is where you can either use the uh, knife and board, or as what I found is quite effective uh, also, is you can just force the soldering iron onto the conductor until the enamel finally melts. So what uh, I recommend doing is first clean the tip of your iron, uh, set the conductor in such a location that you can work on it easily, and uh, pre-wet the tip of your iron slightly. Now hold the wire down and uh, basically just let the soldering iron burn away all the enamel and just let it, uh, let it char the wood underneath a little bit, it won't hurt that at all and pull it away gradually to leave a nice, well-tinned section of wire. And you can do the same. You may need to refresh your solder if the flux is dried up, but do the same for the other side. Just let it burn in for a while, and you're getting rid of that enamel. And gradually, you should come away with a nicely polished off wire there. So now that you have the two pieces of wire uh, pre-tinned, now take your multimeter and set it to the continuity testing uh, feature. In my case, the multimeter makes an audible beep when the two wires are connected together, for example. So we're gonna listen for that when we are working on, conduct on the conductors. So now what we wanna do is uh, isolate which one is ground. So I'm gonna take a guess to see which, uh, to take this green, this dark green one is ground first and what I'm going to do then is take the other side, the barrel connector, and test the ground pin. I'm not showing any continuity, so let's try the other pins. Nothing there, nothing there. That turns out to be the tip. So that means the dark green conductor, the, or the solid green conductor rather, is our tip, is our actual line signal. Now just to verify that uh, they're not shorted out or we're not making a mistake, we should be able to guarantee now that this other side is the ground, which on an Apple device is the second to last ring. So let's uh, adjust that slightly, adjust my grip so I get better connection. And you see now when I touch the second to last grip, I get a signal. And I don't get a signal when I touch any of the other grips or any of the other rings. So what this means is we've now identified that the solid colored conductor is most likely the ground uh, or is most likely the tip, rather, and the multicolored conductor is most likely the ground. So now I'm going to start work on the recipient headphones. Now in this case, I'm going to be cutting them relatively close to the top, but not necessarily all the way, because we want to preserve the original relative length between the earbud and the controller. That way the controller doesn't fall too far down, like on your shirt, where it wouldn't be as easy to access uh, to change the volume as opposed to its original location, which is uh, approximately five to six inches from the earbud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just compare the distance between the two, and I'm probably going to cut it off roughly in the middle, maybe slightly above, and uh, I can always cut more off if I need to later on. 
So as with before, I'm going to make sure that the headphones are roughly the same distance apart when I cut them. However, this time I'm going to keep track of which wire is which. The right hand, the one marked with R, is the one that's connected to the barrel. So I'm going to remember that the barrel is going to go to the right side ear pod. So now I'm going to uh, mark where I'm going to cut these, make the cut across, and sometimes it's a bit tough because of the, uh, the little fiber lines inside. But now that this has been cut, I'm going to discard these, uh, these transducers. You can save them for another project if you want to, but uh, depending on the quality, it may not even really be worth it since really what we're trying to get out is a higher quality transducer for the final product. So I'll set these aside, or rather on the floor here, and uh, now we're going to do the same uh, wire color identification on this side. So what we want to do, this is actually going to serve the dual purpose of identifying the wire and preparing it for our actual conversion. So this time we're actually not going to strip off quite as much as before. Try and aim for maybe an inch or maybe a little under an inch when you strip. So now we've exposed these conductors and I have to make sure I didn't accidentally nick either one of them. So let's get up close and take a look. And it would look as if they are relatively intact. What we don't want is for the two to short out against one another down here. But it doesn't look like that's going to be a problem. So we can proceed with the next step. So now I'm going to follow the same procedure that I did before to apply the solder and melt the enamel. Only this time I'm going to take the flux pen and I'm going to add some additional flux to both wires just to improve the uh, overall attraction between the solder and the conductor. So then I'm going to do the same thing where I hold the wire in place and I'm going to wet the soldering iron. Actually, before I hold that in place, I'm going to wet the soldering iron down slightly. Now I'm going to hold the wire in place and I'm going to just press the soldering iron down and allow it to cook that enamel off of the conductor. I'll clean the iron, tin it up some more, do the same on the other side. And you can hear the flux sizzle very slightly. That's a good sign. It means you are uh, going to be conducting a lot more heat and uh, the solder is going to flow more freely onto the wire. And now you have solder on both sides. So we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to try to identify which one is the tip and which one is the ring or which one is the ground. So I'm going to take the red one first and test against this end. Yep, looks like the red is the tip, meaning that the golden one or the orangish one should be the ground. And it is. And I'll make sure it's not any of the others to rule out a short. So we've identified that now. The red one is our signal line and the golden one is our ground line. So this was a bit unexpected. It appears as if the right hand side ear pod, that is the one that has the actual con controller on it, has an additional set of conductors inside of it. It's got this coaxial conductor. It's wrapped in a sheath of, uh, of wire and then it has a, an inner uh, internal wire. Now I was under the impression that on these headphones the microphone was underneath this hole in the controller, but it looks like in reality the microphone may have been in the actual ear pod or earbud itself. Uh, if this is the case, then it looks like we're going to forego microphone operability in this case. But before we cut off any of these wires, we want to do the same procedure where we wet down the, uh, the two conductors here. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that the red or the green and the golden one are the two audio conductors, the gold being the ground and the green being the, the ring. But uh, let's actually test that first to make sure we're not cutting off our conductors when we're not supposed to. So I went ahead and verified what each of these conductors does. And as I suspected, the green and the golden conductors are respectively the signal and ground for the earbud. What I was surprised to find, however, was that the blue conductor and the coaxial sheathing around it didn't show continuity to any of the pins on this, uh, on this uh, three and a half millimeter connector. 
That's somewhat odd because I would expect that, that would be the microphone or something like it. So what that means is there's some kind of fancy switching logic going on in this little canister here. And uh, for that reason, I'm most likely going to abandon these unless perhaps I find something very similar in the Apple EarPod cable. So we'll take apart the Apple EarPod cables and we'll see if there's anything similarly strange going on in them or if they exclusively handle the microphone within the, uh, within the actual switch uh, dongle. So after stripping back what was left of the Apple EarPod cable, I determined that, uh, as I would expect, the red conductor was the audio line and the golden wrapped with red conductor was the ground. Now it looks like there may be up to three separate conductors in that microphone sense line. There's a golden one, a red one, and a green one. So for the purposes of this uh, demonstration and this modification, I'm going to end up foregoing these all together. I'm only going to focus on salvaging the audio component of these headphones, and I'm going to assume that the microphone will not work any longer. So this is a compromise that uh, I'm going to make just for the simplicity of this video. If you want to retain the microphone in your headphones, you, uh, there, I'm sure there's resources available online which would show what these specific conductors do in each case. But since I have no way of knowing if they're even compatible or if the polarity is different or if there's anything uh, overtly uh, different between the Apple EarPod microphone and the regular earbud microphone, as well as due to the fact that I couldn't trace continuity between any of these conductors and the microphone ring specifically, I'm going to just ignore those for now and focus primarily on the audio component. So I've taken the liberty to strip back and tin all of the relevant connections that we're going to be making. Now it's very important before you start soldering to be sure that you've put your heat shrink over the conductor already or over the cable already. You don't want to do a bunch of really nice solder splices and then remember suddenly that you didn't put on the heat shrink and have to start all over again. So now what we're going to do is we're going to line up the uh, ground wires, which as you recall are the golden and the striped ones respectively. And what we want to do is we want to uh, twist the two around one another so as to make as good a stationary unsoldered bond as possible. Once we've made this bond, then we can apply flux and solder. So I recommend using the flux pen now. I like to hold both sides a little bit and apply the flux to the joint, being sure that you don't accidentally pull the joint apart. Now put the soldering iron underneath it to apply heat and start applying the solder. What you want to see is you want to see roughly an even coating around both conductors. And uh, that's roughly what we got here, which is a good thing. And now we can do the same with the signal line conductor by twisting the two wires together, which is uh, sometimes a little bit harder. Just want to make sure they stay in place when we start bonding the two together. Apply the flux again to this side. And we do the same thing after cleaning the tip of the iron in the tip cleaner. Hold the iron underneath, gradually apply some solder, and hopefully those have bonded. We can test it by giving it a little tug, and it looks like they both have. So now that we've soldered the connection between the wires together, now what I'm going to do is take some electrical tape, maybe just under a couple of inches, and I'm going to slide it in between the two wires in order to provide an insulating barrier between the uh, signal line and the ground line. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the wires somewhat tight and fold the electrical tape over as tightly as possible so that the crease in the tape is right where the connection is. Now what we can do is take the scissors and very carefully and as close to the junction as possible run the scissors along the connection of the tape. Now be careful to hold the tape closed still and take the hot glue gun and now run just a very slight bead of glue along the edge of the tape in order to keep it from popping back open. 
Allow that to cool for a few seconds. Blowing on it may also help it. Make sure the tape stays closed. It will have a tendency to try to open up. And once the glue is somewhat dry, trim away the excess using the scissors. This may take a little bit of time because you really need to get as much material away as possible to accommodate the heat shrink. Now that you have your taped connection here, now what we're going to do is try to get the heat shrink over it. Now you may have to cut it down even further if your heat shrink doesn't immediately take to the to the wire. And uh, it looks like that may be the case here, but what we can do is just take the scissors and try to trim a little bit more material back here, hopefully without damaging the insulating layer. And we can very carefully apply this heat shrink. You don't want to tug too hard on the wires, but you may have to give it a little bit of tension. So there we go. Now the heat shrink been, has been applied over the conduction, or conductor connection. Give both sides a little bit of a tug to make sure that everything is solid and secure. Now take your heat gun and apply some heat until the heat shrink just starts to turn over and shrink. And you'll see it shrinking gradually. It's, uh, I'll get it better in view of the camera here. Once your heat shrink is fully shrunken, you now have a successfully connected ear pod. So now that we've gotten one of the two ear pods finished, I'm going to test out the connection. So I'm going to take another device and I'm going to plug in the headphones to it. And I'm going to place some audio on here. And now what I want to do is listen on the earbud and I'm going to move the cable around back and forth to try and uh, dislodge it or see if I hear any crackling. If it disconnects or if I hear any crackling on the line, then I know there's a problem. But if it seems more or less stable, then I'm going to uh, be certain that uh, it's in good condition. So I'll put it in my ear. And I don't hear any noticeable crackling when I move it around. I tugged on it a little bit and it's not crackling either. That seems successful. All right, so I successfully completed both of these junctions and I tested both of them and they work very well. No crackling or signs of short circuit or failure. Now one thing I do need to notice or I do need to note, a bit of a shortcoming of this is that it relies exclusively on the metal conductors for structural integrity it no longer has those polymer strands inside the wire to hold it together. So that means if you accidentally yank really hard on this, there's a good chance it's going to break or come apart. So if you do this type of maneuver or this type of uh, transplant for these headphones, be aware they may not be as strong as they originally were, and they may be more prone to coming apart. So uh, if, uh, if this is the case, you may actually even want to put an extra layer of heat shrink around the outside uh, planning ahead, maybe put two layers on the wire instead of one. Other than that, it did seem to come together very well. Try as I did to keep them both the same length, one did end up coming out a little longer than the other. So to make up the difference for that, I just tied a couple of small knots down near the uh, branch, near the Y branch, and that uh, cut them right out, right down to about the same length. So now let's see if the modification has served its intended purpose, which is to allow this Android phone to play back audio and modify the uh, volume uh, and playback using the Apple EarPods. So I'm going to press the play button and it's playing. Let's try the volume. Volume works in both directions. So it looks like this is a success. So there you have it. I've successfully modified Android headphones to use Apple transducers. This is pretty effective because I can use the Apple transducers without having to buy a more expensive set of Android headphones to get the same acoustic quality. Additionally, this may actually be applicable to almost any uh, set of headphones provided they have independent earphone cables connected to each side. That means that you could take a nice pair of on-ear headphones if they had a 
uh, separate set of wires for each side, and you could modify it to use the interface controller for any tele or any phone or other media device that you want. So hopefully you learned something useful. Keep in mind this isn't guaranteed to work. There are a lot of problems you could run into, and as a result, it's kind of a do-at-your-own risk project. But it's a good a good opportunity to get some experience with fine soldering, and it's also a good opportunity to just learn how these headphones actually work. So thanks for watching this episode, and I will see you next time.